Hi, my name is Zach Copert. I'm currently a software engineer at GitHub and previously an open source director at Tektronix. So today I'm here to share with you my story about founding an open source and inner source department at my company and why you might consider doing something similar. So let's start with a short story. As a manager of a new team, at my previous job, I spent some time talking to the developers about what they were currently working on. I wanted to get embedded in the team and up to speed on, on what was going on. So one of the senior developers, very talented, uh, came to me and uh, what you're working on? And he said uh, he was working on a six month project to write a web server from the ground up that would work well on our embedded hardware project. I asked him if he'd considered using an existing lightweight web server, maybe an open source project uh, that was well suited for kind of that lightweight, low end hardware that we needed. And he said that he hadn't considered using open source um, and thought that if we did, it wouldn't be as good a quality as what we could create. Um, and um, I asked, you know, well, since you didn't review those, those projects, um, you know, how, how do we know what the quality of those are? And he, really thought about it and it's just like, well, generally open source isn't, isn't very good quality. The stuff that we write here, I know the people that write it and, you know, we're very good at what we do, which is true. Very talented developer. Um, the part that wasn't true though, was the part that the, uh, there weren't talented developers in open source projects. Um, so I knew from uh, past experience that there was, many lightweight web server projects that were very high quality that existed out there um, that, that would have worked for our application and, and saved us that six months. So duplicating the work that had already been created and made available wasn't a good use of our time as a team um, or his talents as a developer, honestly. Um, so I wanted to find a way to encourage our developers at the company to, to reuse as much as uh, they could so that their, their legacy, you know, their career and contribution wouldn't be just recreating existing projects. So digging in even deeper to this theme of maximizing software reuse, we found that the company had several different test frameworks that they used as well across different product lines. Um, so these are separate development teams that kind of work in these, um, you know, uh, silos and different buildings and things like that, or, or maybe in different locations around the world. Um, and they're not talking to each other very much. They didn't know that they both were using different test frameworks and that they, you know, developed these on their own and sort of reinvented the wheel, so to speak. Um, so this, this test framework code wasn't something that was available as open source, but it was rather uh, had been developed by um, different development teams um, inside the company. And so I wondered, uh, not knowing what inner source was at the time, I wondered if there was a way that we could, across the entire company, um, identify reusable software um, and, and let the developers know about it before they were creating redundant work. Because um, it's, it's one thing to have a um, reusable project that you create and go, oh, somebody might use this. It's another thing to actually have them aware of that uh, before they go on creating uh, what they're going to create. So I did some research and that's when I learned about an uh, open and inner source programs office. So they're often referred to as an OSPO for short. Um, and so an OSPO, as I'll refer to it going forward since that's easier to say, um, is a team of people inside of an organization that is responsible for uh, open and inner source policy and practices. What, what does that mean? So for example, a developer might ask, am I allowed to reuse code from this other company project? Um, and that answer could be determined uh, by the company's OSPO or the policy that they put forward. Um, a, a lawyer, as another example, might ask, what license agreements are we bound to regarding product A? Our, government customer or highly regulated financial customer uh, needs to know all of the open source or license agreements that are in that product. So often OSPOs because of this will um, create a policy that say that every project that we develop requires a software bill of materials, just like a hardware bill of materials to be able to build the hardware. We need that for the software. So we know what's inside it. 
it's often referred to as a manifest file. Um, and then that information can be easily found instead of having uh, all of these urgent requests of the customer won't buy our product unless we tell them all the things that are in it. And the guy who, you know, um, uh, or gal who is coding that thing maybe did it 10 years ago and isn't, isn't quite remember. They'll have to look through it. That'll take time. So we can shortcut all of that um, by having these policies and procedures in place around the open and inner source that's in a project. Um, you can imagine a, a vulnerability in a, in a piece of inner source. And um, we find out about this, this vulnerability and, and well, where do we need to patch it? What other projects use this code? Um, you know, being able to have a, a list of projects using that in piece of inner source inside the code itself makes it really easy. Again, these are all things that an OSPO uh, would set up as policies or procedures. Um, so essentially, if you take all of those examples, and you see that an OSPO helps guide developers on when to use or create open source, inner source, or private code. So at this point, I knew that an OSPO could help uh, improve our company's efficiency by maximizing the amount of software we use minimizing the amount of um, you know building it once and never using it again um, and never sharing it and establishing policies around what was appropriate for that reuse because sometimes let's be honest um, maybe a, you know a very special algorithm that's closely guarded we don't want to open source that or we don't want to reuse that um, in another product line because we might we're considering spinning that out as another company and then there will be legal issues and so um, this stuff does have to be done uh, thoughtfully and carefully. Um, so I, I took all of that information that I had and I did something bold and maybe a little bit out of character. And I just asked for it. I set up a meeting with my manager, then the vice president of the company um, and pitched to them the idea of starting an OSPO. I created a charter document um, that was outlining how many people we would need, what problem we were solving and what our goals and metrics would be. They actually approved and passed me on to the president of the company. And he had one of the scariest responses I have heard in my career so far. He said, yes, make it happen. So remember that just uh, a week earlier, I had learned what an OSPO even was. And now I had the president of the company telling me uh, I was leading one. So, Consider that uh, today you might be learning for the first time what an OSPO is from this presentation. And if you uh, can imagine looking around virtually to the other participants here, you know, which one of you might be leading an OSPO next week, um, following a, a similar path to the journey that I had. So it started with, for us, just myself and one other developer, and we set out to create a, a policy on what was to be open source, inner source, or private. We recognize that that meant not only for consumption of projects, uh, the incoming projects, grabbing an open source project and using it, but also for the development. So uh, if we take that example of using an existing inner source pro or open source project, um, you might choose to um, maybe create a project and then open source it. So that would be more of the development. So it's both consumption and development of all three of those categories, open source, inner source, and private. Um, so we utilized uh, some existing uh, OSPO policies that had been made available from Google under a Creative Commons license. And I'll link to those resources uh, here at the end of the presentation. Um, and we met with our legal teams to just take those policies that had already worked for a large company, uh, tweaked them to our company needs and our values and things that made sense for our size, uh, and implemented those. Um, so those policies defined our process for creating an open source and inner source project. They detailed what records uh, needed to be kept and where, uh, and things like that. Um, after the policies were in place, we moved on and shifted focus on inner source projects and communities. So our goal here in shifting our focus was to invest in identifying just a few projects that were good candidates for inner source, uh, again, meaning being shared around with inside the company um, 
that we could grow an internal community around. So we, we needed something that multiple product teams that we had needed um, and they would contribute back to. Otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't really work. You can't force, um, you know, a project that um, others don't need. You can't force them to use it. So um, it's got to be something that is organically needed by, by multiple groups with their own development teams. Normally, they would create that on their own, but instead we wanted to find this inner source project um, that could, could serve all of them. So we, in doing that, we found uh, support in the to-do group, um, so their website, again, I'll link at the, at the end of the presentation here in the resources section, but um, essentially they're a community of OSPO leaders that uh, have experience doing exactly what we were trying to do, trying to build these communities um, around an inner source project, trying to figure out policies about how to open source something and what license to use and what license not to use. And, um, and just how to manage a community. So that was extremely valuable to us. I uh, highly recommend uh, those folks in that community and the documentation that they put together. I'll show you some, some guides and things that they've got. So on our journey, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. We did have some difficulty uh, and that came in when uh, establishing our metrics um, by which our OSPO would be, um, and, and the OSPO projects, would be measured. One of the metrics in particular really caused this uh, issue in, in communicating. Um, and that metric was money saved by software reuse. Even saying that now, it gives me chills like, oh man, we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, uh, it, it was initially a great idea though. We had a wonderfully, uh, uh, wonderful idea about these huge numbers uh, and about how much money we were saving every year. Um, you know, millions of dollars we're saving the company this year by reusing these projects because we could identify and do the math that, hey, instead of creating this project over here and the same project over here, recreating it and recreating it once again over here for three different products. Well, we were only developing one thing and then getting it reused everywhere. And so um, and so that was saving us the cost of, of development and all of those things. So wasn't that great? Wasn't it great? We were saving the company all this money and we were pitching this to the leadership that was funding us. And they were just so confused. They wanted to know, where was that money? <laughs> Show me where, where that money uh, savings is. Like our, our costs, our engineering cost center is not going down. Like we're spending the same amount on, on development. And so was that even real? Turns out as headcount is static, our cost didn't go down um, because the true results were really that we were able to deliver products faster and with higher quality. They're faster um, because uh, we just got to the next thing quicker as we didn't spend all this time redeveloping things. They're higher quality because it had more attention and being used by more users. Um, so they were tested better. So overall, it was by my own measures and by our other less troublesome metrics, a huge success as an OSPO. Um, and, and it was something that just the two of us could uh, affect the entire engineering group. So here are these resources. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through them and, and say that the inner source uh, commons.org has helpful practices and, and tons of guides and a community around it on Slack um, to help you get started with this. The to-do group has the guides that I mentioned. Um, OpenSource.google slash docs has the uh, policy that they actually use. Um, and then Viturgia as well is gonna help you uh, not make the mistakes that I did with metrics. So I just wanted to thank each and every person that joined me here for this talk. Uh, I appreciate your time and attention that you've given me while I share my experience with you. And I hope uh, it has inspired you as well on your own journey. Here's my contact information again, if you'd like to contact me. Uh, thank you so much.